Hi guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here. I'm here tonight outside a bar called Hashrena, just outside of Mahane Huda Market in Jerusalem. And I'm here tonight to check out a book event. An interesting guy called Gal Kalev has written a new book. It's called Judaism 3.0. Its controversial treatise is that Zionism or support for the Jewish state has become the fulcrum of modern Jewish identity. Is that a good thing? How long has that been the case? I caught up with Skull just before the event to ask him a few questions. Hello everybody. Uh, Judaism 3.0 is a book that uh, is about the current state of Judaism. Judaism is going through a historic transformation and Zionism is becoming the anchor of Judaism. I'm showing how both people uh, in Israel, Jews, non-Jews, people in America, uh, people that are for and against, uh, all relate to Judaism through the prism of Zionism, including in the negative. The book is really a, a survey of Jewish communities, of non-Jewish communities of the world, touch points with the Jews, uh, to show that Judaism is transforming, just like it has 2,000 years ago, that Zionism is becoming its anchor. And then I spend time, uh, in the end of the book, discussing what it means. What it means both in terms of the opportunities it unleashes, uh, but also in how it can address the threats to Judaism and uh, first and foremost the existential threat of Israel bashing, uh, anti-Zionism if you will, that have replaced traditional anti-Semitism as the currency of opposition to Judaism. Do you think that Zionism has been more of a unifying force or divisive for Jews in Israel and the diaspora? I think Zionism has become the meeting point of the Jew with his Judaism, whether it's in the positive or in the negative. Whether we like it or not, uh, American Jewry, which is about 80% of the diaspora Jewry, is in a trajectory towards evaporation. There is very low uh, things that, you know, most of them are not religious, most of them are denationalized. Uh, survey says that the most common connector is Jewish food. 75% of American Jews are connected to Judaism because they eat Jewish food, but they also eat Chinese food and Italian food. It's not a, enough of a sustainable connection. But Israel and the national aspect of Judaism, Zionism is. So for example, a lot of my American friends uh, connect to their Judaism when they see an article in the New York Times about the settlement, they get upset and they write a Facebook post, as a Jew, I'm embarrassed about Israel or something along those lines. Zionism puts them back into their Judaism uh, and it's true in all of the gamut of uh, position, through support and everything that's in between. And also, let's face it, you know, people look at you as an as a American Jew through the prism of Israel. Whether you like it or not, if your name is, if you have a last if your last name is Jewish, you walk into a college campus and somebody says your people are murdering the Palestinians, you have to react. You can say I agree, I disagree, you know, let me think. It forces you in. Nobody is asking you about Jewish food when you come into college campus or about the Holocaust anymore or about religiosity. Israel is where the Jew meets his Judaism and where the outside world meets the, the Jews and that's what this book is about. I'm showing, you know, uh, how that is becoming a reality today in the 2020s and what does it mean? I ask you a question. So sometimes Israel speaks in the name of world jury as, you know, we see our job as being defending Jews worldwide. A lot of people like me would say that's not Israel's job and also it's not fair for Israel to kind of force itself upon people who don't want to be associated with it. So how, how do you feel about that aspect? No, sure. I mean, like, nobody represents you anymore. I mean, this is, we live in a, in a world that there's choice, you know, some call it the postmodern world. It's a, it's a world where you have a lot of identities. So of course Israel doesn't represent you. I mean, Israel in our core, we feel responsible if you're ever in trouble as a Jewish person will come and save you. This is a core tenement of what, you know, uh, the, the Jewish state is. We don't represent you, just like, you know, you, we're not represented by, you know, uh, any other one of your affiliation. You know, you might have gone to Harvard. Does the Harvard Alumni Association represent you? You have your own identity in relationship with Harvard. You might have a particular gender or sexual, uh, you know, whatever it is that identity that you are, part of the, you are who you are. And other people might claim they represent, but you are who you are. What Israel does, I think, is whether you like it or not, you are defined as a Jew through Israel, whether you whether it's in the positive or in the negative. So it's not by, by design and it doesn't really matter. This goes back to Herzl, he, he, he understood that Jews cannot escape their Judaism. Whatever is the most relevant aspect of Judaism, there will be the aspect of Jews you know, that people will relate to. Not the most relevant aspect of Judaism is Israel and Zionism. And, and you, you can bash Israel, it's not going to help. You're still going to be affiliated with Israel uh, and that's so that's what I'm showing in the book. We are in a different phase of Judaism and that's by the way why the anti-Semitic, traditional anti-Semitic attacks against 
uh, Jews uh, are you know sad and and and, uh, uh, and damaging, but the attacks some by Jews against Israel are the one that have an impact and can uh, cause long-term damage to the sustainability of Judaism. Do you see any uh, future for diaspora Judaism in general? I hope so, but you know I think the future goes through the vector of Israel. I think as as it is the uh, diaspora Judaism, and in which 80% of it is American Jewry, is is not sustainable. They're, they're, you know, the, the Jews has always been a nation religion. When the religious aspect, you know, was strong, then the religion was uh, was sustainable. That's no longer the case. And they denationalized. They became, you know, they sort of like reduced American Jewry to the Jewish Church, but then became secular. So what it creates is that you know there's very little to hold on to that. I'm not saying it's not sustainable. Israel comes in and sort of like provides that glue to Judaism uh, that other aspects of, of Judaism uh, did not have before. Whether it's in the positive or to negative, again, this is what, um, uh, whether you like it or not, that is the most relevant aspect of Judaism. Simple question, Zionism being the fulcrum of modern Jewish identity, is that a good thing or a bad thing? In my view, that is a great thing. That is the essence. In my personal view, this is, you know, as Herzl designed it as a Jewish concept. And, you know, there's somebody in the event here that talked about Arab Cook. You know, so there's a religious aspect of it. There is, anybody can approach it. My book, you know, has uh, people that are religious and seculars and atheists and people from the left and from the right, progressives, Trump supporters, everybody. Zionism uh, is designed by, you know, you said we have, we, we got Judaism in our, in our hand. It is designed to serve uh, as the focal point of Judaism, uh, as, the, as, a, as a mechanism for the Jews to return to their Judaism. And once they return, they can consume other aspects of Judaism, including their religious aspect. So Zionism, in a, is a sense, have saved Judaism, uh, including American Jews that are critical of Israel, and including those who claim they're anti-Zionism. Zionism is sort of a, a lifeline for them as well, back into the Judaism, assuming they want to stay Jewish. It's also they're perfectly you know, free if they choose to try to evaporate. But what I'm saying and showing in the book is that even if they say we're evaporating, uh, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't work this way. You know, you're still affiliated with your Judaism and you're affiliated through, through Israel, and that's why Zionism is the construct that allows you to... What's your book called, American People Buy It? The book is called Judaism 3.0, Judaism's Transformation to Zionism. It's available on Amazon, and Book Depository, and Barnes & Noble, and all the online uh, sites, and in stores. In Israel, it's available in Pomerantz, in various other uh, bookstores. Cool, thank you so much for your time, John. My pleasure. The, the basic premise is that uh, uh, Judaism is going through a historic transformation. Today's Judaism is very different than the Judaism that we had uh, about 100 years ago. A uh, hundred years ago, and really for, for 19 centuries since the Jews were exiled from this place, Jews lived in diaspora, in the diaspora, in what I call Judaism 2.0, 1.0 being when they were here, and they had an internal uh, glue of religiosity, uh, rabbinic Judaism, meaning the synagogue and the, and the halakha and, the, uh, and the, the canonization of the oral Torah, and then an external glue of complete insularity. Jews simply cannot get out of Judaism. Uh, but both of those have eroded uh, as uh, Jews became secular. Today, 80-90% of the Jews are not sufficiently religiously observant to make that uh, you know, an anchor of their identity. Uh, and the Jews are no longer insular. They're free to leave. They're free to assimilate out of existence if they want. Uh, but at the same time, the religious anchor of the Jewish nation religion was uh, eroded. The national aspect has been dramatically augmented when the State of Israel was founded. Uh, so as I show in the book, uh, the first 70, 75 years of Israel's existence didn't lead to a transformation of Judaism. Uh, and that is because uh, there were a lot of hurdles. For example, Zionism was uh, associated with secularism and even rejection of religion. That wasn't by design, it wasn't in Herzl's plan, but that's how it evolved. Uh, and other aspects, including the Haredis that we like to speak about, uh, and the ultra-Orthodox used to be anti-Zionist, they're no longer anti-Zionist. I argue in my book that they're a poster child of Zionism, whether they like to admit it or not, but de facto. So I talk about all those hurdles, and I talk about uh, trends around the world and global trends, such as the trend to have multiple identities, that you're no longer um, just boxed in a particular part of, of your identity. So if you're an American Jew, uh, even 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it would be weird if you would say that I am an American Jew, I'm, I'm holding an American passport, but I'm also having uh, an affiliation with another nation, the Jewish nation. 
uh, that would be strange, uh, because in America, of the early days certainly, you had a homogeneous narrative, the Mayflower narrative. If you wanted to be like your neighbors, you know, Mr. the, the Joneses and the Smiths, um, then, you know, you basically had to reduce Judaism to the Jewish church, so just like the Smiths go to their church, you go to your church, but that's it. Now your neighbors are no longer the Joneses and the Smiths, they're the Rubios and the Rodriguez's and they're the, the, the people who are from various parts of the world who are um, uh, celebrate their national heritage and identification uh, while uh, maintaining the strong American uh, um, um, uh, identity. So Americanism is built on um, uh, sort of multiple branches centered and anchored in a strong trunk of Americanism. Uh, so you see today, you know, Vice President Harris is proud of her affiliation, Jamaican affiliation, and, and, and her Indian affiliation. Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, the Republican senators, are proud of their Cuban national affiliation. Not their Christian affiliation, but their national affiliation. So, and that's no longer in conflict with being with being, uh, uh, you know, there's no issues of due loyalty or anything like that. So I, I'm showing how trends like this in the book have um, affected the, the 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 state of Judaism and uh, and the transformation of Judaism that could not have occurred 70 years ago uh, because of all those hurdles is occurring now in the 2020s. A lot of people thought that they can escape Judaism. All we got to do is convert and become, you know, baptized. And Herzl showed that the only difference is that they'll stop calling you uh, a, 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 a Jewish pig and they'll call you a baptized pig. So the same today, uh, the, you know, you had um, um, something quite remarkable happen in the United States earlier this year, right around the time that my book came out, which is the synagogue in Chicago uh, have uh, got together uh, to declare they are anti-Zionism, Zionism, and more so anti-Zionism is a core value of uh, who we are and who we live. And that's quite astonishing because it's exactly what Herzl predicted that Zionism brings you back to your Judaism. Because American Jews, uh, especially uh, the, you know, the ones who are not Orthodox, 90% uh, of American Jews, um, Judaism is low in their hierarchy of identity. They don't go to synagogue. They don't, you know, keep, you know, the halacha. They don't, um, you know, think about the Holocaust. They don't do anything that is that is uh, that that serves as a very strong and sustainable anchor. But here comes Israel and Zionism and brings you into your Judaism. Uh, uh, love or hate, I show that this is where a Jew meets his Judaism and where uh, Judaism. That's how the outside world perceives the Jews. So what does it mean? So on the one on the one level, you know, I'm calling it the state of Judaism. So Ju this is the state of Judaism. Uh, Judaism is transformed, now we're in the uh, in Judaism 3.0 and Zionism is anchored, that's the argument. But I also spent time at the end of the book and also in many of my follow-up articles uh, to ask what does it mean. And the way I see things right now is that uh, uh, the, the Judaism is under uh, an attack, an assault, uh, as it always been. There is uh, always been illusions that the opposition to Jews uh, is temporary. Uh, and Herzl identified something very, very strong, that European opposition, because at this time the Jews were mostly in Europe and the opposition to Judaism was European. Opposition to Judaism is chronic, it's permanent. It's not going away, it just evolves as European circumstances change and as Jewish circumstances change. So at his time, this is before the, the term anti-Semitism came, at his time people thought that Jew hatred is over. There's no more opposition to Judaism because that opposition used to be religious. You know, the Jews use the blood of Christian children and all those ritual, you know, to be rituals and all those uh, religious currencies. Once Europe became secular, a lot of people said, this is it, end of history, no more opposition to Jews. So if you think that, that, that there's still Jew hatred, you're paranoid. Here comes a new form of opposition to Judaism, which is a byproduct of the emancipation of Jews. Uh, opposition to the Jewish as a nation, because they're successful, because they're this and that. This is what was dubbed later anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism became the new form of opposition to Judaism. Uh, today, uh, traditional anti-Semitism, calling the Jews rich or control Hollywood, uh, is damaging and it could hurt individual Jews, but it's not an existential threat to the continuity of Judaism. But Israel bashing is an existential threat to the continuity of Judaism. Israel bashing is also uh, the primary uh, reason, uh, uh, the primary so uh, cause of attacks against Jews. I did a, an event with Michael Owen and said that 70% of attacks against American Jews 
you know, anti-Semitist attacks against American Jews in America are driven by Israel bashing or by by, uh, by Israel, by somebody being upset about Israel. So Israel bashing is, is both uh, a, a threat to individual Jews, but also the survival of Judaism because Israel bashing has a mechanism uh, to inflict severe damage. So for example, the International Criminal Court, under the, the flag of Israel bashing, is investigating all of us here today. They're having a broad investigation against Israel, Israel, you know, soldiers, people who live in the settlement, by the way, Jerusalem is also considered a settlement of most interpretation of international law. So we're all potentially, you know, we, who knows, we might go to Europe uh, next um, year and get arrested. That's not happening tomorrow, but there is just, I'm saying that there is mechanism today, there is no mechanism to take Jews control Hollywood uh, and, 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 and convert them into an existential threat to the existence of Judaism. But there are mechanisms, you know, obviously other multinational organizations, you know, we're seeing what's happening now with uh, this uh, modern iteration of blood libels. You know, it used to be that we uh, murder uh, uh, ch uh, Christian children, and uh, in the 1840s we murder monks, now we murder journalists. So, you know, we see how all of these um, energies are coming uh, at the Jews this time through Israel. Now this doesn't say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very clear in my book that we should encourage criticism, even ones that are misinformed or, we dis or I disagree with, but you know, the, the bashing of Israel, uh, the, 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 lack, uh, the, the, the lack of acceptability uh, that we really um, have the right to be here, a right to defend ourselves, uh, th that is the form of Israel bashing that is, that is an essential threat to not just individual Jews, including those who bash Israel themselves, but to all of Judaism. So once you recognize that Zionism is the anchor of Judaism, then you can no longer hide behind this idea that you love the Jews, but you hate the Zionists. Just like maybe 2,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, you couldn't hide behind the idea that you love the Jews, you know, those that used to worship in temple and do the sacrifice and live in Judea, uh, but you hate the, the, the Jews that celebrate Hanukkah and wear a kippah and study the Mishnah and wear and the Lacha, because that was the current iteration of Judaism. So you can say, once there was an acceptance that we're in Judaism 2.0, meaning that, we're, that the religious aspect of rabbinic Judaism is the anchor of Judaism, then you cannot no longer hide behind saying, I love the old Jews, but I hate the current iteration of Jews. Same thing today, you can no longer say, you know, once you accept this, once you accept, and a lot of people do, that we, that, Ju that Zionism has become the anchor of Judaism, that uh, I love the Jews that, you know, used to be religious and used to, but I hate the most relevant aspect of Judaism, which is Zionism. And we have an asset, and the asset is that, unlike in the past, it's no longer fashionable to say that you hate Jews. In the past, it was very normal. Theodore Herzl had friends who said that, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm a Semite, I don't like the Jews. You know, for various reasons. Now, if you say you hate the Jews, you can get fired. This is like a bad thing to say. But if you say you hate the Zionists, you know, that could get you hired. That's like the rites of passage in certain circles. So once you accept that we're in Judaism 3.0 and Zionism is Judaism, that you, you, you are, the, the, the existential threat to Judaism gets mitigated. That doesn't go away, but it's a better um, uh, platform or a better framework uh, to counter that. So, uh, that's the, the, the uh, you know, addressing the threat, but it also unleashes a tremendous amount of opportunities. I'll, I'll, I'll stop in a few minutes just so we can have an interactive conversation, or if you want to have an interactive conversation. But, but uh, you know, a lot, you know, Herschel identified something. He understood that uh, the Jewish state will exist not because of the moral obligation of the nations and of Europe, and not because we have a right which we, we do, and not because of the support we have from the Arab, you know, in, in his time, you know, the, the Arabs, uh, the, 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 the Emir Faisal was a Zionist, and he understood that we will only exist if we will become the necessity of the world. He said the Jewish, Jewish state will exist because the world will need it. It will be a necessity of the world. And Israel today has become such necessity, but it's being hindered. You know, so we might have a great development, you know, that might, you know, um, uh, save, uh, you know, cure cancer, but somebody might say, no, 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 the development occurred, you know, behind the 67 lines, and no, 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 you know, so, so we cannot spread this light to the nations. Or other aspects that we have, we have this sort of like continuous assault at Israel that's not coming as much from the Middle East as much as it's coming from Europe and, and, and other uh, parts of the international community. So once there's a recognition that you know we Zionism is Judaism, uh, then it opens and paves the door 
for much of the light that's emanating from Zion to be spread to the world and for Zionists for, for Zionism to fulfill one of its mission, which is to be the lights upon the nation. Of non-Orthodox Jews today marry non-Jews. So that's the highest number, that's, that's what defines you. Very similar to what you said. And the other one is criticism of Israel, because a lot of Jews are critical of Israel. For various reasons. Like one of the Jewish leaders explained to me that, uh, I mean, who was, you know, adamantly like ethnic cleansing, all the kind of slogans that they throw at us, and they said, well, we have a horse in the game. We're getting attacked because of Israel. So we're trying to say, you know, yes, the, the Israeli Jews are the bad Jews, but we're the good Jews. You know, so yes, they do all those bad things. Ethnic cleansing, you know, uh, genocide, uh, uh, assault Palestinian women on roadblocks, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, all this, all this, all the slurs that you... And this is deja vu all over again, because the same thing, you know, that when the German Jews had all the Russian immigrants came in, and some of the German Jews said, yeah, you're right, the Jews, the Russian Jews are a problem. You see them everywhere, the beggars, the peddlers, and some of the Jews, according to some research, voted for Hitler. You know, because they thought the problem, they wanted to make sure that, the, the, you know, we're German Jews, we serve in World War One. we have no problem. We, we, so, you know, nobody buys this in the, in the American. A, a Jew that kind of uh, bashes Israel puts himself at risk and bashes himself. He puts himself at risk because, as we mentioned, you know, according to that statistic, 70% of attacks against Jews is because of Israel. So, in a sense, when the American Jew says, you know, Israel is doing horrible stuff to Palestinians, he triggers, you know, those attacks against him. You know, if somebody, if he says Jews control Hollywood, that's less of a, less of a trigger. So if you have to say something at that Jewish, you're better off saying that you control Hollywood and that you're, you know, greedy and rich and that's it. You'll be safer. But, but worse than that, you know, he, nobody buys it. So I've done, as part of the preparation for the book, I've done, uh, I visited some, uh, sites that could be perceived as anti-Semitic and some all tried far right websites and I looked at one of the slurs that I used against the New York Times and George Soros two people that are not suspected of being Israel lovers I don't think any of them have Israel's flags in their uh, phone screen scape savers or anything like that but the slur against them is Zionist the Zionist New York Times, the Zionist George Soros, because people don't make the distinction anymore between Zionists and Jews. That's, you know, so by the way, a lot of the people that saw this book saying, like, I don't understand, fine, you're saying something that's obvious. You know, of course Judaism and Zionism. But, but, so, you know, so you cannot escape. So those Jews who say, you know, yes, we are the good Jews, you know, we're the good Germans, they're the bad, you know, they're the bad Russian Jews who are coming at us in the 1920s. Uh, or, or we're the, today the good Jews who are, you know, liberal and, and, and the Jews in Israel, you know, now the majority of the Jews are, you know, the, the one who are doing all those horrible things. You basically, the way that people hear it is that we as Jews are still doing horrible things. So we used to kill children, in the 1940s we kill monks, now we kill journalists. So it, you can't, it's ineffective to make that distinction. But to get to the point of the book is that, that you are defining yourself your Judaism through Israel, whether, you know, in this case in the negative. So that's, that's, that's what it is. You are the one, you the American Jews, critical or sometimes bashes, bashes Israel. You are the one who's proving the thesis here because you're defining your Judaism through Israel. I'd like to say it sometime in another way. If you, map, if you take an American Jew and look at all of his interaction with Judaism in a, in a given week or in a given month. So if you're an Orthodox Jew, then religion will be clearly number one. You know, uh, but if you're a non-Orthodox Jew, an unaffiliated Jew, if you're like one of the, what they call super Jews, let's say you're, you know, non, non religious Jew, you're maybe an atheist Jew, but you're involved in a Jewish organization, then that's fine. You know, you're, you're involved in other Jewish causes, but the majority, the 80, 90% of American Jews who are under-engaged, if you had to map out all the Jewish related activities, transactions in a week, Israel will be number one in a, in a wide margin. Maybe it's a conversation in the bar about Israel, maybe it's a positive thing, maybe it's like, I want to consume Israeli wine. Maybe it's like I'm proud of you know going to an Idan Michael concert. Or maybe it's watching watching Fauda or Stissel or something like that. You know, you have you know in, or, or the negative as we talked about here. You know, you get upset about the New York Times article. And the reason you get upset about the New York Times about article, article about Israel and in some other area is because you feel Jewish. And and as you write in the Facebook post, as a Jew, I'm embarrassed. So so you so you have whether you like it or not a connection to your Judaism through Israel and it's and there's nothing you can do about it.
there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. You can continue, you know, with the trajectory of the American Jews to bash Israel and, and, and to pretend that you can draw some sort of artificial wedge that nobody buys, or you can just own it. And don't put yourself and your family at risk. Don't say that we're, you know, committing all those genocide and horrible things and assaulting Palestinian women at war, but don't do that. Don't lie and don't invent stuff against us. Don't say we're killing Christian children or killing monks in Syria. Don't do that because it's not helping you and it's just damaging you and putting you and your family in danger. Criticize us as much as you want. And the more you criticize us, the, that's fine because that shows you care. Criticize us out of love. And that's what I think Judaism 3.0 is, is a platform to criticize Israel, to love Israel, to, to uh, uh, have issues with Israel. Uh, in whichever way you choose and whichever way you, way you want. Europe's relationship with, with Jerusalem, with Israel, and I view that as a, as a 23 year, 100, 2300 year conflict. And I interact with it with my European diplomat friends, including very senior European diplomats and politicians who don't agree, but they interact. So I'm not saying this is like an angry kind of, you know, we have a conflict. I, there's an Israeli Palestinian conflict, there's an Israeli Arab conflict, but I think it pales in comparison to some of the other world countries. There's a conflict in Spain, in Spain, Catalonia, Italy, in Tirol, Europe and Islam. We have a strong conflict, a big conflict between Israel and Europe that's been, that, that has lasted since the Greek invaded and tried to uh, uh, eradicate, and Judaism tried to Hellenize us. The Romans tried to do the same thing. Uh, and when we didn't work, when we refused to be to Europe, become Europe, Europeanized, then they destroyed our temple and kicked us out and, and kept us as refugees in Europe for 2,000 years where they abused us and murdered us and deported us from one place to another. So that, that, that currency, that hate, always followed the uh, relevant aspect of European society and the relevant aspect of where the Jews are. So, so what I'm saying is that when in 2,000 years in, in the diaspora, there was hate. And, and, the, and because Europe was religious, it had, uh, you know, it, many, some clergy uh, uh, claim that Christianity, or some, not just clergy, but the Christian um, uh, researchers, that, that Christianity was hijacked by European Jew hatred. So the, 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 the hatred was expressed to Christianity, but it wasn't, because that was the relevant currency of Europe. When, when Europe, as I said, became secular, then yes, I'm saying everything stayed, but it stayed in a different form. So it's no longer, you know, you guys killed Jesus and you guys are using the blood of children to make, uh, you know, matzahs, but it is you're using the blood of, uh, you're just killing journalists now. Maybe two points. One, they hate us. They continue to hate us, right? That's basically like a core, print, a core premise that you have. Uh, I can use hate, oppose. Okay, and two, essentially what you're saying is recognize that that's not going to change, thus we need to find a way to accommodate ourselves. So making us ourselves essential to them is a way not for them to, they won't stop hating or opposing us, yes. but they'll, they'll, lead us. they'll lead us, so then therefore... Yes, so then over time they will actually us. like us. So it's a battle you know. Sorry. In a way it's a battle It's a battle, it's, a, it's peace through strength. And, and that, that, is, that is, I think, what I'm, I'm drawing from my rabbi, Herzl. You know, who recognized that, who recognized that this is not going away because at his time, a lot of people, one of his rabbis, or one of the people that inspired him, he read his book, Moshe Hess, he wrote a book called From Rome to Jerusalem, and Herzl he took that book in his journey from Europe to Jerusalem. And Moshe Hess thought, this is it, you know, once the power of the Vatican gets reduced, and once, you know, the, the Europe becomes secular, end of history and you know of course we'll have a Jewish state because Jews will be free and let's not forget that at that time you know and, and until you know recently a lot of the world wanted the Jews to come back including you know there was you know prior Zionist pro Zionist Arabs so so you know so I'm saying peace through strength because we, we have no other choice and, and that peace through strength is not having you know nuclear weapons because we cannot outdo that is is through our asset, which is the Jewish brain, which is again what Herzl and many Christian thinkers also in the 19th century identified, that once the Jews would be emancipated from this European occupation of their mindset, they'll produce innovation that will alter humanity. We are still being opposed by Europe. You know, all this stuff, you know, they're going to Soda Stream and trying to close it. We, I mean, the, 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 the path to peace is from our European friends, they are my friends, by the way, you know, they're, they're having the same conversations you know, with that, you know, go back to Europe. 
go back to Europe and let us and our Palestinian friends work it out. We can advise you about your own issues and problems, which is a lot. I mean, you know, some of those uh, things we see in Europe are horrific. I mean, the images of French armed police approaching a Muslim woman on the beach and ordering her to take her clothes off are horrific. You know, there's not, you know, so, so th there's, there's issues in Europe that needs to be addressed. But those issues should not be directed at us. Europe should go home to Europe and stop funding all those, you know, anti-Israel, which also anti-Palestinian organizations because they promote, perpetuate conflict and, 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 uh, and, and hate, to be blunt. Uh, and and we, we should help you in your struggles. But that is the path to peace. And uh, and not just peace without between us and the Arabs, peace between, you know, the conflict, the 23-year-old, 2,300-year-old conflict between Israel and Europe. Uh, and once that gets resolved, so to use your kind of framework, Fine, maybe you want to call it, you know, messianic times or something like that, no problems. You know, some an atheist might want to call it like the greatest time in our human progress, that's fine too. I wasn't pointing at you as an atheist. Uh, you know, anybody, uh, anybody can put their own kind of framing into it. But I'm saying that we have to recognize exactly as you said, that this is, the, that the opposition to Judaism is permanent. It is strong. We're still, you know, there is no, we're not going to address it by a strong military or by other, we're going to address it by uh, making, uh, becoming the necessity of the world. And then over time, maybe the generations will forget it. You know, part of the issue is this sort of like religious arrested development that some Europeans have. You, you know, you know, it's the fastest rising religion in the world is European atheism. This, 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 this zealous, you know, like the, the, the reason that uh, those Muslim women are being, what we call in the West, sexually assaulted by the police on the beaches of France is under the banner, it's a religious war in a sense, because it says we are a secular country and we're so secular and so atheist that if you're wearing, if you're not wearing your, if you're wearing your tzniyas clothes, uh, then we're going to make you take it off. Or if you're a, a woman who refused to have physical contact, you know, with, with, with your immigration office, you qualify for Swiss citizenship, and congratulations, I'm giving you a citizenship, I'm gonna shake your hand. He says, I'm sorry, I don't do that because I'm a woman and I don't have physical contact with men. You're gonna be denied your citizenship. This is horrendous stuff for us, at least. But, you know, this is, this, is, this is done in the name of this, you know, extreme secularism. You can say it's just a you know code name for you know we want for Islamophobia and other things, but but they say no 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 we are secular secularism is a value for us, so you know so we and this gets back to what I said earlier about Americanism versus Europeanism. Once there's acceptance that Zionism is not just about Aliyah, but Zionism is 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 broader, then it paves the path towards Zionism becoming the anchor of Judaism. So yes, there is a, there is a. That in my view, when you sit in your in your home in, in uh, New Jersey and you watch uh, Fauda, or you drink Israeli wine, or you write a post as a Jew embarrassed about Israel, you know that connects you to your Judaism through Israel, and you, you and you're not here, so that's cool. And it used to be, you know, the, in the 1950s that we did it every Jew here, you know, you know the old, you know. The, when our conflict, you know, I don't view our conflict to be with the Arabs, I view our conflict to be with the Europeans in our long-term, multi-decade survival of Judaism. So, you know, you know, it's no longer a game about how many uh, Jewish bodies there are between the, you know, the, the Jordan and the sea. So it's no longer about we need every Israeli, every Jewish here, and how dare you not come to Israel as a Jew. So, as I mentioned earlier, in Judaism 3.0, the connection of the Jew to his Judaism through Zionism is an organic one. The Jew initiates it. Whether it's by choosing to watch Father or whether it's choosing to write a Facebook post as a Jew, I'm embarrassed about Israel.